You better buckle up, because this one, this one's a big one. Let's go make a belt. Hello everyone, my name is Daniel Reese. This is Weaver Leather Supply. Today we're going to be doing something that I've dubbed the Four Feathers Belt. And the reason it's called Four Feathers is because there's three different sections, and if you count the feathers, each section has four feathers in it. Now, when I first started this project, I really had no idea how big of a project it was going to be. But we're going to walk you through it so that if you want to take a shot at it, you've got all the information you need to be able to do an amazing job at it. Now, as I went through the project, there were all kinds of parts that were a little scary. There were parts where I thought I destroyed the project and I was going to have to start all over. There were parts where I was like, ooh, I, I don't know if I like that. And then there were other parts that's like, I, you know, I could do this and it'd probably be the best thing to do, but if I do, I could destroy the project. So there were a lot of questions as I went through this. And then there was one thing that I did that just totally didn't work out and I had to redo completely. So I'm going to be showing you all of that. I want to bring you along for the ride, show you the ups and downs, the, you know, the good decisions, the bad decisions. That way you can kind of learn from my mistakes along the way. And, you know, in addition to that, I'm going to be throwing in some ninja tips that I don't think you may have seen before. Now, because this is such a big project, we're going to be relying on Chuck's videos as a supplement. He did a series a while back on how to make a belt. It was a five-part series where he dove into the, the details of how to make a beautiful belt. So I'm going to re be referring to that a lot so that this video doesn't end up being a three-hour video. So what are we going to be using today to make the belt? Well, we're starting with two of the Weaver belt kits. And now you don't have to have two of the, the belt kits. You can take a strap cutter and make two inch and a quarter straps and it'll work just fine. For me, I wanted to go with two of the Weaver kits because I knew they would match perfectly uh, and it just kind of streamlined the process for me. We're also going to be using the free pattern. You can get that in the description below. And then there's quite a number of tools that we're going to be using to do this. All of them are going to be listed in the description below. There's a link that will take you to a full list of everything that I use in the video. So check that out for sure. So where do we start? Pretty much the same place we start every time, and that would be the prep steps. We're going to tape the back. We're going to case the leather. We're going to trace our pattern onto it, and then we're going to start cutting it in. So like I said, this is a fairly large project, and if I were to go into every step in great detail, this would be a, like an hour or two hour long video. So what we're going to do, as I mentioned, some of them we're going to kind of skip through pretty quickly, and one of those is going to be the prep steps. If you need a little bit more help on how to prep a project, the taping, the casing, the tracing, and that kind of thing, we just did a video a few weeks ago. Go check that out, and it'll walk you through the whole process. So this is a little bit of a unique belt in that it has two layers. We have the primary belt blank. That's the one that's actually going to buckle and hold your pants up. The other layer is the tooling patches that we're going to attach to it. So you're going to hear me refer to two different things. We're going to tooling pieces and the primary belt blank. And we're going to start with that primary belt blank first. First thing that we want to do is we want to create our tooling window, which is also going to double as our stitch line. And the way we're going to do this, we're going to take our wing dividers, we're going to set it at an eighth of an inch, and then we're going to gently and carefully run that down each side of that primary belt blank. Now, the trick to making sure that your lines end up straight is to keep your eyes on the tine that drops off the side of the belt. You're, you don't want to watch the one that's creating the mark. You want to watch the one that's up against the edge of the belt. That's going to give you the best shot at making sure that your lines are straight. Now that we've got that done, we're going to take our bevel and we're going to knock off the corners, all four corners on that primary belt blank. Now I told you we were going to move through this kind of fast. So if you need some help on beveling a belt, Chuck's videos that he did a few years ago on how to make a belt cover this in really good detail. So I'm going to refer you over to that on the, on the ins and outs on how to bevel the edge of a belt. All right, now that we got that done, we can set the belt blank aside and grab our other strap. Now it's just a matter of transferring the tooling pattern to the strap. Now, one thing I'll point out, there's a smaller pattern. You've got the belt end, you've got the one that holds the buckle, and then you've got a third one. You need to make two of the third one, so make sure to trace that in there twice. So you remember I told you this project was a little bit of a comedy of errors, and honestly, it was all my fault. It was Everything that happened was all on me. It's not like it, the project decided to go sideways. I just screwed up. And one of those is that... Apparently, I was trying to trace 
one of the patterns in with my eyes closed because I don't know how you trace a pattern this badly with your eyes open. I really don't. But you can see from the still frame here that, man, it, what was I doing? Was I Did I have my eyes closed? I don't know how you do that. But I didn't find that mistake until I started cutting the pattern in, so I had to go back and retrace it in. So just know, you know, you're going to have project fails. You're going to have mistakes in your projects. That's just part of it. Even after you've been doing it a little while, we still do it. So, uh, you know, just the way it goes. So as you start tracing the pattern onto the leather, you're gonna notice there's a lot of straight lines in this. And one of the tips that I would have for you is to just put dots at the top and bottom of those lines. Don't try to freehand them in. Then you can go back with either a wing divider, a ruler, or a groover, or something like that, and put your lines in that way. Instead of trying to freehand those lines in, it's a lot easier to do it with a ruler or a wing divider, or something like that. But that's my pro tip for you. So as you're cutting this in, there's three things I want you to pay attention to. Number one, we don't connect cuts. Number two, taper your lines unless they dead end into another cut. And number three, go slow enough that you can control the depth of the cut and you can control where the cut ends. All right, so now it's time for beveling. The first thing we're gonna do is we're gonna take that primary belt blank and we're gonna do all the beveling on that. You've got a parallel line that should go up and down that belt blank. Now I know it's a lot of beveling, but think of it as practice. If you're still trying to get your skills under your belt with a bevel, this is a great time to really focus on making sure you have the basics under your belt and that you're not getting choppy marks in there. If you need help on that, we did a video uh, maybe two months ago that kind of goes through how to work a bevel, how to correct mistakes and that type thing. But let's start with the primary belt blank, get that out of the way, and then we can move to the beveling on the individual tooling pieces. So for the tooling pieces, we're gonna be using a steep bevel. Now, if you don't have a steep bevel, that's perfectly fine. You can use a traditional bevel. The steep bevel is just gonna fit in tighter spots and it's gonna give you more of a crisp line, but you can absolutely do this with a traditional bevel. Now, one thing I'll point out to you is that I'm doing the center of the feather first. I'll do one side, I'll flip the piece and I'll do the other side. Then I do the outside of it. That just allows me to kind of get into a flow. Uh, I'm not having to turn the piece any more than I absolutely have to. And it just speeds up the whole process. Next, we're gonna be matting the background of those tooling pieces. Now, don't worry, we're not gonna be doing this to the primary belt blank. That would be a lot of matting and backgrounding. But what we are gonna do, we're gonna take the smallest checkered backgrounder that you have, and we're gonna mat down the background of all the tooling pieces. I want you to take your time with this, really get in there in all the little nooks and crannies, get as smooth of a texture in there as you can. The trick to doing this is to use what I call the nibble technique. And it sounds ridiculous, but essentially what it is, you're using the leading edge of that backgrounding tool to nibble away at the, the background. And the rest of the tool is helping smooth out the work you've already done. If you go in there and try to use the entire footprint to you know, do it pretty quickly, it's gonna be very choppy. So just use that leading edge, that will nibble away at the background and the, the rest of the tool is gonna smooth it out if you need more detail on that, you guessed it, we did a video on it not too long ago. That will be in the, the Weaver playlist. So go check that out if you need a little bit more information on how to run a backgrounder. So now we're gonna start adding the texture to the feathers. But before we start that, I wanna make sure that you know how to keep the tool oriented the correct direction. Otherwise, it's gonna mess up the flow of the leaf or the feather that you're working on. 
What we're gonna be using is called a leaf liner. So I wanna jump over to the tablet and show you what I'm talking about. So let's jump over there real quick. So if we're looking at this leaf, the lines coming off the stem should go with the leaf. They essentially go down the leaf like that, right? And if you orient the leaf liner correctly, that's what happens. If you orient it the wrong way, what's gonna happen is you're gonna get lines that go the opposite direction that you want. So how do we do this? What does the leaf liner look like? How do we make sure that it's pointed the right direction? So let's bring the leaf liner up. So this is the stamp that a leaf liner would make. And the way I want you to think about this is like an arrowhead. You have a pointed end and the fat end. And the pointed end always goes the direction that the arrow is traveling, right? So if this were an arrowhead, it would be shaped roughly like that. And this is the direction that you're traveling. So if I take this and let me, give me just a second, I'm gonna lower the opacity on this so that we can see through it. There we go. So you can kind of see the, the leaf liner in the background. Now, if I were to change the shape on it, You can see that the direction it's traveling is this way. And we've got the correct side. You're gonna get lines that come off like that. If we back that out and we were to go to the other side, you can see that the direction we're traveling still uh, points the general direction of the arrowhead you can see the arrowhead still pointing the general direction that we're going. And as we move, it's gonna to continue to point that direction. So now we're gonna go in with a leaf liner. We're actually gonna work the center of the, uh, the feathers. We're gonna use this technique to do it. Make sure that the pointed end of the arrow points the direction that you're going. That'll make sure that your lines always come out oriented the right direction. So as I go through and I'm adding the texture to the feather with the leaf liner, notice how I'm doing all of one side all the way down the tooling piece, then I flip it and I do the other side. I'm not going back and forth. That's gonna make it a lot faster, a lot more efficient as you do this. Once we're done with that, we can jump over to the hair blade. Now, why does my hair blade look a little bit different than yours? Well, that's because I've taken the blade out of the original handle it came with, and I put it into one of my extra swivel knives. You can do the same exact thing, and what this does for you is it allows you to get those contours in the lines a little bit easier than it does with the original handle. You can still do it with the original handle it comes with. This just gives you a little bit more versatility and flexibility. So now that we got the texture in the feathers, we need to add some to the belt blank. Now, why do we need to do this? Well, if we just take the belt the way it is and put the tooling pieces on that belt blank and put a buckle on it, it's not gonna look cohesive. It's gonna look like we took a belt blank, slapped some tooled leather on it, put a buckle on it, and called it a day. And that's not what we're going for. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna take a rough textured tool and add it to that center tooling window of the belt, and that's gonna pull the whole design together and give us more of a cohesive look. So as we're doing this, make sure you take that texture all the way up to the edge of the tooling window. Now we can go ahead and start cutting out those pieces that we tooled so that later on we can attach them to the belt. It's pretty straightforward. We're gonna use a craft blade to do it, but you'll notice it's not the typical silver one that you get at the craft stores. Uh, this one comes from Weaver and I love how heavy it is. Now it's not ridiculously heavy. It's just got a good weight to it, feels good in your hand, and it's a lot easier to use. It's more ergonomic and I really like the way it feels, but if what you've got is an X-Acto blade, that will work. 
We're just gonna go through and cut out the different pieces. The one piece of advice that I would give to you is that it's very important to make sure that your blade is straight up and down. We don't wanna under or over cut that edge. Just keep your blade straight up and down and you're good to go. Multiple passes, that helps a lot. Fresh blade, multiple passes. While I'm cutting that out, I wanna tell you about the next time I almost ruined this project. If you look at the smaller tooled sections that we're gonna be attaching later, you'll notice that there's a circular section in the middle. My thought was, I'm gonna take my blade, cut those out, and then I can inset my concho down into that. It'll be kind of a cool look. Well, what I didn't realize is that means that those little smaller tool pieces are completely unstable. There's no way to attach it, to stitch it to the primary belt blank, and it's a terrible idea. And I didn't figure this out until I'd already cut them out, and it was too late. So why do I tell you this? I could have just as easily left it out of the video and nobody would have ever known. Well, I want you to understand that trying new things sometimes means that you fail, but if you learn from it, guess what? You didn't fail. We all make mistakes, the project fails are gonna happen, it's just part of the hobby. Don't get discouraged, you're not the only one doing it. So now we can breathe a little bit. We got the tough part behind us. Now it's just color and stitching, right? So next what we're gonna do is we're gonna work with some dye. Those tooling pieces that we, we worked earlier, we're gonna add dye to those. Now I'm using a brush just because I'm doing it indoors and I wanna limit the amount of fumes, um, but you can use a dauber, you can use a sponge, you can dip dye. Any of those will work. It's just gonna affect the dry time. Once the tooled pieces are done, now we can move over to the belt blank. And there's two ways that we're gonna be dyeing this. One is the border down each side of the belt. We're gonna dye that. These are both being done with mahogany. So we're gonna dye the borders on each side of that belt blank, and we're gonna add it to the back. Now I'll caution you to go light when you add it to the back because I have had it where it will bleed all the way through and it'll spot the front. So just go real light as you add it to the borders and to the back, and you're good to go. All right, so I told you I had some ninja tips for you. Here's your first one. Take your token oil and put it in a needle bottle. You can get these from Weaver, uh, and then you can turn it upside down and just apply the, the token oil directly to where you want it. Now, in the past, I was using my finger to apply it to the edge because I didn't want to waste any. It's, it's a pain in the butt, it's a mess. This is so much easier. So here's where I'm gonna ask for your help. Getting the token oil in the needle bottle is a little bit of a pain in the butt. I filled this up about a third of the way and it took me like 20 or 25 minutes. It's totally worth it, don't get me wrong, but it took 25 minutes to fill this thing up to about right there. It's with a funnel and a chopstick and me trying to push it down into the bottle. It's ridiculous. So here's what I'm gonna ask you. If you've got a better way that I haven't thought of of getting the token oil into the needle bottle, Leave it in the comment section below. Here's another tip for you. If you're using the needle bottle to apply the token oil, as you're in the process of slicking the edges, lay the bottle on its side. That way it stays more or less up towards the end. If you sit it up like this, you have to shake it and it, it's a pain. Just lay it like, and it, yeah, it's easier. So we got the edges slicked, now we can start painting. Typically, if I'm using white, I'm not using just straight white. I'm gonna use some version of an off-white. But we're gonna end up antiquing these, so no matter what we put on there, it's gonna end up an off-white. So I'm just using regular old Angelus white. Probably gonna need to put two coats on there. Take your time, this is the fun part.
Once you're done painting, you can go ahead and seal it with an aerosol sealer. My favorite is gonna be Leather Sheen because it locks that color in really nice and tight. If you need to see how to do it, you guessed it, we just did a video on it. Once that's done and dry, we're gonna antique it with Phoebing's Cordovan. I think that's how you say it, Cordovan, Cordovan. Yeah, I don't know how else you'd say it, Cordovan. The tooled pieces with the paint on it, I'm wiping the antique off pretty much immediately. The belt blank, however, I want a lot more color from the antique to stay on there. So I'm gonna let it sit anywhere between 25 and 35 minutes. You can even go up to 45 if you want to, but I let this sit for about 25 minutes. So once you've buffed off the majority of the antique, you wanna let it rest for maybe an hour or so, something like that, just so that antique really locks in and it's not gonna go anywhere. After that, after you're confident that the color has set, the antique's mostly dry, you can go back in with a paper towel or a sponge or something like that, get your tan coat on there and very lightly buff over the top of it. What that's gonna do is it's gonna brighten it back up. That antique has a tendency to make the colors really muddy and really mute the, the project. And if you go back over it with tan coat, well, that's gonna lift that residue off there while leaving the antique down in the, the recessed portions of it. It's really gonna brighten your project back up. Let that set for another half hour to 45 minutes and you're good to move on to the next step. Now we're to the point where we can start looking at attaching the, the tooling pieces to the belt blank. One of the first things that I noticed, and this had occurred to me before I got here, is that if you've got two layers of leather and you fold it, well, now you've got four layers of leather and that's a lot of stacked layer. That's a lot to manage when you're getting the belt on and off. That's a lot to run a rivet through. So we got to do something about that. We can't have four layers of leather and that bend in there. That's just too cumbersome. So what I decided to do is I took my, my corner knife. This is a Kodo Maru corner knife and these things are amazing. Uh, these are not a drive, like where you hammer on the top of it and drive it through the leather. These things are so sharp that you literally just push it through the leather. So essentially what I did is I took my corner knife and cut off the end of the primary belt blank and I cut it off just before the slot for the buckle. And what this allowed it to do was bend much easier. Now I'm just bending one piece of leather instead of two and I can skive it down so that it really tapers out and now we don't have the bulk that was in there before. Now I can bend it over and I've only got two layers of leather with a center core. But if you notice, that center core is still pretty thick and bulky. Well, the solution there, and I know you're not gonna like this word, the solution is to skive it. Nobody likes skiving, I totally get it, but I wanna share a few tips with you that's helped me a lot for when I have to skive something. And notice I said have to skive. I don't skive because I want to, I have to. But there's a couple of things. Number one is always, 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 did I say always, always put a fresh blade in anytime you skive something. That fresh blade is literally the difference between an easy time skiving your project and having to take blood pressure medication and throw your project away. It's that big of a deal. So always a fresh blade every time you skive something. They're cheap. Number two is that having the leather dry, for me, makes it much easier than if the leather's wet. If the leather's wet, it wants to stretch and move. If the leather's dry, it wants to resist the blade, which means it's a lot easier for that blade to bite in. It's a lot easier to go slow, which is another key. Take small amounts of, of leather off because you can always take off more. You can't put it back. So fresh blade, dry leather, go slow. So Chuck's talked about for a long time that we need to start a club called the I Hate Skiving Club, and he's the president of it. I think what we need to do is talk Weaver into making shirts that say founding member of the international I Hate Skiving Club Weaver Leather Supply. So if you think that's a good idea, if you would buy those shirts, I'll put a comment in the comment section below. You can like it and leave a comment down there so that maybe we can talk Weaver into making those shirts. And they have no idea I put this into the, into the video, so this, this should be interesting. But maybe we can talk them into making us some shirts.
So here's my next ninja tip for you. We're gonna be using gum track to slick the back of the belt. It gives it a nice finished texture. Well, what do you use to actually do that with? Well, there's lots of products on the market, but one of the things that you can do that's a good use of your scrap leather is you can make your own slicker. Now, this is just a rectangled shape piece of leather. It fits in my hand nicely. I put two rivets on each end of it and it's got a bend right here. It just naturally has a bend to it. And that gives me something to actually work the back of the belt with and really slick it out. Because it's so smooth, it works fantastic. As you're working the gum track into the back of the belt, you'll notice that I'm going the same direction with all the strokes. I'm not going back and forth like you might if you were slicking the edge. You want to take the gum track and push it all the same direction down the belt. We're working with moderate pressure and just know you might have to make a couple of passes. After it dries, it may not be smooth enough. You may want to go back in and do it again. We're in the home stretch now. We're going to take those tooled pieces and attach them to the belt blank. And the way we're gonna do that is with leather weld. Now you're gonna see me using another needle bottle. This one has leather weld in it, and this makes it so much more simple. It really allows you to apply small amounts of glue to specific areas. The other advantage to doing this, let's say you have an area that on the edge that opens up because it didn't glue, get glued very well. These needle bottles will allow you to get down in those little tiny areas and apply small amounts of glue and not get it everywhere. Because if you've ever tried to glue leather in small, tiny little areas, it ends up getting everywhere. These needle bottles really simplify the process. So to glue the pieces together, we're gonna need to rough up the surface of the belt blank. The thing that you wanna pay attention to with that is make sure that you don't rough up an area that goes outside what that top piece is gonna cover. After you rough it up, put the glue on there, put them together. You want to add a little bit of weight and then wait. So now that everything's glued together comes that scary part that I told you about at the beginning. I knew when I put this project together that I was going to have to do this and I've been nervous about it the whole time. So why is it so scary? Well, you've got the tongue of the belt, you've got the piece that's glued to the top of it and it has to be skived down. Otherwise it's just going to be clunky and cumbersome and it's, it's just not going to work. It's too thick, right? So I've got to skive it down. Well, the problem comes if I mess this up, I don't have any more belt blanks. I've got two. So if I screw this up, I'm out of luck. There's a lot riding on this. So I've got to get it right the first time. So I did what I told you before. I replaced my blade, made sure the leather was dry, and I went in and slowly started taking leather off the, uh, the inside of the belt. Now that it's glued, we can go ahead and start punching the holes so we can stitch this thing. And because of the shape, especially those two small center pieces, uh, I found it a lot easier to, to use my wing dividers to space the holes out. That way I didn't have to rely on the stitching chisel. So that might be something you wanna take a look at too. Just set your wing dividers at the same width as your stitching chisel, and that should simplify the whole process. So as far as stitching goes, Chuck did a video a few years ago that does a great job of explaining how to saddle stitch a belt. So I'm gonna let his video cover that and explain how to saddle stitch the belt. We'll put a link in the description so it's really easy for you to find. So how do we know where to put the conchos and those tooled pieces that go with them? Well, Chuck did a great job of explaining this in his video where he shows how to make the belt. So I'm gonna let him be the one to really explain it in that video. In fact, that's where I learned how to do it. But the simple explanation just for now is that you take the length that you're working with and the number of conchos that you have, we have two, you add one to the number of conchos. So that gives us three. So you divide your length by the number of conchos plus one. So two plus one is three. We divide our length by three. So now we have three smaller conchos and three gaps. And the easy way to figure out where they go is to measure each one, divide it in half, and that's where your concho goes.
Punch the holes in the end of the belt. Add the buckle and you're good to go. That's gonna do it for this video. I will see you in the next one. In the meantime, go make something amazing.